jacked up here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lisa Pursley. I'm from Spencer, West Virginia. Between the bare and the bright, March is not a month for remembrance. Most graves remain undecorated till May, when the calendar tells us to buy for the buried. Gravestones dot the hillside like they did before we cleared them for the dead. Each year, between the bare and the bright, nature pushes through to pay respects to the world. The wild pear is the first to whisper with soft white tufts of bloom that could be mistaken for snow, it bursts so early. The next to arrive, Forsythia shouts as it sets fence rows and creek banks ablaze with blossoms of sunshine. In the third act of spring, the pink purple petals of the red bud appear like tiny hands waving hello and goodbye at the same time. Time unfolds. Yesterday's sway in the breeze, memories like laundry on lines in the autumn, waiting to be gathered in early evening. The tiny Polynesian dress of brown and blue purchased when my parents reunited in Hawaii for my first birthday sharing a face full of frosting while mankind stepped onto the moon. A house dress gifted from my grandmother, straight from the hook on her bathroom door because I said I liked it. It was soft and cool like mid-May mornings in leather bark. One pair of toddler blue jean overalls worn by both my boys, Mason until his shoulder straps could be let out no more and Luke with legs rolled up to fit until he too was hip high. The chambray dress with brown buttons from calf to neck and two large pockets sewn on front, just the right size for tissues, crayons, and pieces of family secrets. Row after row after row of Nike socks, cleansed of cleat and high top sweat, red and white and many, many black from a decade plus of practice, cheering and consoling. Now I take each memory down and fold it lightly, place them one on top of the other in the large wicker basket, even the socks with no mate. Place the basket on my hip and carry it inside and keep them safe in the chest my father made for me. And the last one is rhododendron strong. I was not born here, but my mother was. My grandmothers were and my great grandmothers. Moving to these mountains with my children was an inevitable homecoming, the culmination of July days and Christmas nights. The inspiration seems obvious in their slick clay and random runs down every hill to hollow. But for me, it's always the people. The women here are as I imagine they were in my great-grandmother's lifetime, stubborn about staying, eager to leave, ready to head home, and content no matter where they land. I have lived among others, but these are rhododendron strong and foxglove vulnerable, a grace that brings both sorrow and awe. I'm Tanya Matney Reynolds, I'm from Cincinnati. This is fiction, Invisible Girls. We were the ones who fell between the cracks in the social order. We loathed the popular kids, the jocks, cheerleaders, cheerleaders and rich kids. We pitied the stoners and the nerds. To all of them we were invisible, shadows on the tile. We wore camouflaged pants, oversized shirts, shoes with untied laces, and only enough makeup to cover our zits. 
We were grunge before grunge was a thing. During pep rallies, we read Sartre and Flaubert and Nietzsche. We were adored by the administration for our GPAs, AP scores, and early admission letters. We challenged the teachers with our randomness. Hypothetical questions and ethical debates on some days, head on the desk naps on others. Any time we needed to skip school, we would look into Mrs. Daly's eyes just as we had practiced and handed her folded absence notes written and signed with fat, curly, motherly signatures. We had become impervious to punishment. We were superheroes. On a night we would never mention to our parents, we bought tickets to a Pink Floyd laser light show. We poured beer into Burger King cups and sipped it through straws. We filled the bottoms of our purses with cans of Bud Light and covered them with tampons. We piled into a Chevette and headed south, legs pressed together, windows down, wailing dark side of the moon as the sun set over Cincinnati and the river was beneath us. For two hours, we watched the light show in our 3D glasses and forgot we were different. Afterwards, we staggered to the car with only tampons in our bags and our glasses still on. We ooed and awed at the street lights, now prisms beaming rainbows of shooting stars in all directions. When we neared the chorus of wish you were here, we crossed the bridge and stared at the city in rainbow. A tarp flapped from the back of the truck we followed, almost keeping beat to the song. Boys called to us from the left lane. We touched our fingertips to theirs as they sped past. The tarp flew off the truck. It spread its dark wings and landed upon us. It covered our windshield. Our car spun off the road. We screamed, we ducked, we waited. We're okay, we said, we're all right. That night we slept alone in our beds and wondered how long our superpowers would last. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Hi, um, I'm Becky DeTori, and I grew up in Fallensby, uh, West Virginia, Steubenville, Ohio, and I'm now living in um, Florida. And this poem is called Uncles. My grandmother's fatherless West Virginia boys slouched on stone walls and smoked cigars, bought with a swagger and with nickels hard earned from the man with sparkling eye and stony face who through shop window watched for them. My grandmother, strong arms and a sleeveless dress, hangs laundry in the wind, jumping whoosh like a whip, vestments from the altar and pink and white striped sheets. Brash these boys who shoveled their way downtown, gathering newspapers to trade for cups of hot chocolate from folks whose approval was revoked by evening when the boys crouched behind cars and grabbed bumpers for a ride over ice-covered brick roads. My grandmother, in smoke blanched on of cold, thin light, boils oatmeal and blouses. In star prick night, she walks to where a suspended Jesus hears her prayer. Vicki Pritchard. I'm a nurse and I'm from Southern Ohio, the poorest county in Ohio, and of course it's an Appalachian County. I want to read this letter to you. I want you to come on home now. I got phantom pains, your spirit being cut off from me and all. Don't bother to Facebook me with some squinty message. Just get ready and come on home. I don't want no more pictures. I don't want no texts all that gobbledygook. I can't tell nothing about your spirit, not from some old darned email. 
Call me on the telephone about your airplane arrangements. This here letter is the last one I intend to write. There's no reading between the lines on this. Come on home. Get me unburdened. Come for my stories. I'll breathe them into you. I've got bloodline stories, stories of the world, back when it still smelled sweet. Come on home. Don't miss me as I pass by. Is this at a good height now? Yes. Okay. For me, yes. So next person you'll need to raise it up. So I'm Wendy McVicker and I live, I'm from Athens, Ohio. Well, I'm from Eastern Pennsylvania. I've lived in Athens, Ohio for 30 years. I have three poems for you. Because the girl, because the girl was taken off her meds, because she had to leave the hospital, because the fat cats want to get fatter and kick the skinny alley cats away from the bowl of fresh meat, because no one seems to care what happens to the kids, to the crazy, to the abandoned and confused wandering souls of all ages, because her very skin tormented her and her hands had no work and felt helpless to hold back the demons, because we turn away from her howls, her red-faced screaming tears, because she has no home or family to hold her. She ripped all her fingernails right out by the roots and then followed the bloody handprints back to the hospital and begged them to take her in. Our homes were places. Our homes were places of surface order. Some even had plastic covers on the furniture. We sat on the rug to watch TV where the whole world was pink and yellow and sky blue, even in black and white. Fathers, or sometimes a teenage boy named Darren, mowed the lawns. In our desks at school, we re rebuilt those neat spaces, using rulers and books to mark rooms, drawing faces on our pink erasers. Here is the mother, here the father, and here am I outside on the cool grass with the dog. At home, dusk came early, and night lights shaped like cartoon characters lit our restless sleep. Breaking glass was always swept up by morning. The desk folk didn't need light, not more than we gave them every 50 minutes opening our desk lids to change the subject. On Fridays, at desk inspection time, we piled our books by size, lined up pencils and pens, relegated erasers to one corner. They stayed still and quiet. They showed us, and we were learning. If you're careful not to move, no one will know what you're up to. And this last one is called Bad Buddhist. He said, that's why I'm a bad Buddhist. I'm so attached to everything, to all the lovely details of this scarred world. Even the rusted bolts locked tight. Even the ice-burned pines pointing to the sky. When we came out into the stinging night, snow was falling, already covering the grimy piles of slush with its feather brightness. The crooked houses in our part of town hunched their shoulders and glowed gold. I didn't turn on the radio. I didn't listen to talk about the weather or Syria or the boys losing basketball team. I listened to the squeak and scrape of wipers on glass, to the car's warm laboring and to the dark 
filling with crystals just outside my window, seeming suddenly truer than all the rest. Attached, yes, but floating. Thank you. Hi, my name is Karen Scott, and I'm an Air Force brat who lives in Columbus, Ohio. My poem is Pocahontas, Virginia. Summers meant trips down south, not the deep south, but the hill country of Virginia and West Virginia. A month of military leave for daddy, three months vacation for mom, the teacher. We practiced saying yes ma'am and no sir, because we didn't have to say that at home, but the old folks expected it down there. Being prepared to eat something when calling on people, even if you're not hungry, because everyone would offer and no one would take no for an answer. In Pocahontas, Summers found me sitting on my grandmother's porch, perched high on a hill, cutting out Betsy McCall paper dolls, climbing upstairs past the painting of the blue boy to share the bed with Granny Julia, snuggled under a hand-stitched blanket quilt, waking to breakfast prepared on her wood-fueled cook stove while the electric stove sat nearby, neglected. Eggs, bacon, biscuits, and apples from the trees outside, redolent with cinnamon, sugar, and butter. As I got older, I helped Daddy cut brush and bramble and make repairs. Down the hill, around the corner, and up another hill was Uncle Maceo's house. In college, I boldly ventured down on my own for a visit, drove my car as far up the hill as my nerves allowed, then had Uncle Maceo turn it around and park it properly on his side of the street. Summers at Granny Julia's were custom made for a bookworm like me. The TV only got one channel, so why bother watching? I did watch Granny Julia though. I learned what it meant to age gracefully, to give selflessly. I learned to admire the kind of courage and tenacity it must have taken to become Mother Julia to a teenage boy and his siblings after the death of their mother and to earn their lifelong respect and love. Thank you. I'm Renee Nicholson and I'm from Morgantown, West Virginia. Zen Cancer Saloon. In the Zen Cancer Saloon, you won't find Clark Gable nor John Wayne. No six shooters, nor swinging wood doors. The drinks are damn near poison. Drops steady like a soaking rain. The patrons readily offer up their stories, like a platter of fried chicken, side of okra, another of collard greens. Stuff they no longer eat. A shot of whiskey, just to settle the stomach. Complaints are few at the Zen Cancer Saloon, and if the fare is noxious, the surf is pretty good. A smile, a kind of currency, the tips, not bills nor coins, gonna lick this thing. Better laugh than cry. Que sera, sera. Every day's a gift, even on the drip. The one place where it'd be okay to bitch and moan, but the patrons never waver. Line up at their recliners as if bar stools, trade in happiness, list the things they're grateful for, and slip into that stupor of not quite slumber, the racket fading, last call, tab, closed out. Boy killed on the Grafton Road. Drive-in closed for years, 
Blank screen shrouded by dusk, pushed against hills, tucked in the crook of a valley. 55 miles per hour, turns 35, and it's all turns, the way roads wind through West Virginia. Signs only remind us how safe we'll never be. His middle school didn't close. In 10 years, who will remember one boy's favorite color, what book he was reading? Dim stars illuminate that dingy screen, wing-flickered ghost boys, scenes we'll never know, just shadows across that gray matter expanse. Empathy is all we got and never enough. Fall showers, cold rain collecting in steel barrels, pulling in clogged gutters, damp earth, night sweats, moon dipping into the black pavement, the black sky, that impenetrable quiet. Dreamland. My father dreams of West Virginia, his boyhood on granddad's farm, hunting dogs, baying, and tomatoes in the garden. Now he's tucked between other mountains and a man-made lake. We dream as not to die, and when my father dreams, it's not coal mine shuttered, not abandoned towns, or J.C. Penney's turned into senior centers, not heroin or oxy. He fished streams, gutted, cooked, and ate what he caught. He rolled through what passed for highways on a motorcycle or in a Triumph TR3, bought with money from news and sentinel routes. Listen to the pirates take the series on a radio set on the chrome edged table. Now rested, fiesta wear chipped. But dad, maybe this is the only place we belong. A broken place with its ragged side of the heart. Today I saw a man with an enormous suitcase. He dragged it down and out of town. What treasure might require such effort? In West Virginia, I bought an old house. I fill with oddities and books like my father's dreams. I live almost heaven imperfect. So close I might have touched the night as it pulled across the sky a dark curtain. The sun eases through the threadbare spots. It slits and frays soon enough. My name is Melissa Zook, and I'm a family physician from uh, Bury, Kentucky. Alma could have stepped out of a Dorothea Lang photograph. Built of sturdy bones, wrapped in sinewy muscles, she was covered in skin, stained with dirt, nicotine, and the scars from a lifetime of abuse. Alma had the vacant stare and unhurried nature of a woman who got hungry her entire life. She appeared mid-40s, but a glance at her chart told me she was little more than half that age. It was warm in the office, but Alma was huddled in a vast and filthy pink, down-filled puffer coat, circa 1987. Shivering and sniffling, she was using the back of her hand to wipe the snot from her nose. I need help, she said. I gotta get off the needle. My mommy and brothers are dying, and I gotta be there to take care of them. Alma's daddy, Vernon, taught her how to shoot heroin when she was 12, and he tired of hustling copper and pawning stolen electronics for dope money. You wouldn't believe how many dirty old men are out there, Alma whispered to me. Vernon hustled his strung out teenage daughter in exchange for Roxy 30s and heroin until a drug deal gone bad left Vernon dead, a vehicle on fire, and Alma with a bullet through her left flank. But Vernon's toxic legacy survived through the hepatitis C he passed on to Alma, her brother, and her mother, through the needles they shared to inject methamphetamines and opiates. Now, at 56, Alma's mother was dying of cirrhosis, and her brother James had metastatic liver cancer. Alma had driven the three of them to the University Hospital two hours away in Lexington a couple of times. 
The family understood enough of what the doctors had said to know that they wanted to go home to Goose Creek where they could smoke at will and die in peace. They'll be buried on the hill behind the trailer by Daddy, Alma said. Now Alma sees me weekly because she wants to. On good days, I see the shy but curious 11-year-old girl she must have once been. I compliment her on her sparkly nail polish, and she asks me about motherhood and about my childhood. She is fascinated by the concept of growing up in town in a row house. She cannot fathom being so close to the neighbors. On bad days, I see a woman bereft. She sits, arms wrapped around her knees, and she rocks, back and forth, back and forth. There is no bitterness, no self-pity, just grief and loss. Now, without her mother and brother, she is alone in this world. We talk about her worthiness, about her intrinsic value as a human being. I asked her once to think about something she might want to do that would nurture her. I gave her a few examples, including going for a walk, taking a long bath, and drawing or praying. I ain't never had a lay down tub bath. I ain't got a water hook up by the trailer most of the time, and I ain't got no bathroom know-how. I take me a bucket bath on the stove. She stops, head cocked, mouth agape, lost in thought. I'd be so clean, I'd squeak. Her bark of laughter, her delight at this extravagant, ridiculous fantasy makes my day. I'm Felicia Mitchell. I'm from South Carolina, but I've lived in southwestern Virginia for almost 31 years and call that home. Oh, Washington County, southwestern Virginia. Knitting circle yarns. They're bear stories or as wild as bears, each one wilder than the one before. A grizzly, an early riser, a tent ripped to shreds. A bear crossing the road by a river in daylight. The stories mesmerize, their climaxes shrill. These words are like musk to my bear fetish, one of the knitters says, and she is right. My bear story pales in comparison. It stands on two feet, arms outstretched, waiting for a denouement, but my yarn is full of ellipses. I could tell a better tale if I went home early, grabbed an apple, and slept in the woods. My knitting could wait. Craig County, Virginia. It is so easy to drive into the countryside, except for a guilt gasoline pours onto dreams, onto my dream, to walk into another wilderness. Even in a hybrid vehicle, I know I hurt the earth. Except for a guilt gasoline pours onto dreams, I feel more hopeful when I am on a country road, even in a hybrid vehicle, I know I hurt the earth, but I drive on, hoping to love the earth a little more. I feel more hopeful when I am on a country road. I believe in all the signs in yards, on barns, warning us, but I drive on, hoping to love the earth a little more. No pipeline, no pipeline, no pipeline. Fracking wants to pour chemicals into this land, onto my dream to walk into another wilderness, to a more innocent land, untouched, still protected. It is so easy to drive into the countryside. All Hallows' Eve. At dusk, a screech owl calls until firecrackers across the street silence in, it into a ghost afraid to haunt. Even so, I sit waiting in the chair on the back porch, a patient witch, 
Soon as night falls, I will dig a grave and bury everything I never said, sweeping it all under the fig tree that will shade this grave I make of all that is unfinished. And then I will shake the dust. I will shake the dust of my hands, the ashes of an unfinished year, into a bed of half-dead zinnias, while chanting the name of hope and the only language I speak. I will become a screech owl then, until I finish my careening, and then I will shout, who, 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 until the barred owl in the side yard awakens for its evening prayers. Night will fall fast on this night, and tomorrow will be ready to come. In the light of day, I will stand by the fig. Nobody will know what is not there. I will breathe and begin again.